So uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Andrew. Um, I'm with the Climate Witness Project, and I'm joined tonight by my co-host and friend, Steve Mulder, who is a consultant and regional coordinator for the Climate Witness Project. So on behalf of the Climate Witness Project, um, we would like to welcome you into this space. Uh, we are very blessed and privileged to have uh, Professor Deborah Reinstra with us tonight uh, to really help us explore how we can become uh, people of refugia, people of resilience in response to the climate crisis. Uh, we also want to explore this evening how we can adapt our faith and practice to find and nurture refugia in the earth, in our human cultural systems, spiritual lives, et cetera. So, uh, we're happy to have you all here. We will be doing all this through the lens of uh, Professor Reinstra's new book, uh, which is Refugia Faith, Seeking Hidden Shelters, Ordinary Wonders, and the Healing of the Earth. But before I formally introduce Professor Reinstra and begin our discussion, I wanted to run through um, a few housekeeping details uh, for tonight. So um, as I said, tonight's event is sponsored and brought to you by the Climate Witness Project. Uh, for those of you who are not too familiar, um, I see some familiar people as well. Uh, the Climate Witness Project is a campaign of the Christian Reformed Church Office of Social Justice and World Renew. And we walk with congregations, individuals, um, organizations as they learn about the realities of climate change, um, as they seek to be better stewards of the resources that we have, um, and more importantly, as they find their voice and communicate to elected and public officials uh, to advocate for common sense climate policy. So that's given you all a kind of 30,000 feet of our project. Um, Another housekeeping detail I wanted to chat about is sort of giving you all a roadmap for this evening. Uh, so we will begin um, as, with some introduction of concepts and ideas from Professor Reinstra, um, and then we'll follow up with some discussion questions that Steve and I um, have, and then we would open it up to you all. We are particularly interested in hearing uh, your perspectives and your musings and questions you have from reading the book, from engaging with us. Um, and any questions that pop, us to, uh, pop up through this discussion. So we invite you to use the Q&A feature um, that you can find. Uh, please put your questions there. Um, when we get to the Q&A section of the evening, we would um, answer your questions. So please, please uh, feel free to use that. You can also uh, use the chat function if you want to use that um, as well. Another um, detail is that we will be following up with you all uh, and sending some follow-up information and resources in the coming days and also an opportunity for you to provide us with feedback. So um, look forward to that um, in your inbox. Um, I think that covers all the housekeeping details I had. Steve, is there anything I'm missing? I don't think so. Okay, um, so so let's get started. Uh, so Professor Reinstra um, is a professor of English at Calvin University. Uh, she's also the author of four books that covers themes um, spanning from motherhood, spirituality, worship, ecotheology, and climate change. Uh, professor Reinstra is also the host of the Refugia podcast and writes bi-weekly for the 12, um, a blog connected with the Reform Journal. Uh, so. We're really excited to have uh, Professor Reinstra with us today. Welcome again. Um, so let's get let's get right into it. Uh, we asked you to to sort of as a way of 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 introduction to to guide us and orient us and I think personally educate us into some of the fairly new ideas and somewhat familiar themes in your book um, to sort of set the tone for our discussion before we get into the questions um, and insights from other people. So I would like to turn that over to you first um, and then we will proceed. Okay, great. Thank you, Andrew. And I just wanna begin by thanking Andrew and Steve for hosting this, for coming up with the idea, for arranging all the organization that needed to happen. And I wanna thank you folks who are here uh, tuning in, whether you've read the book or not, I'm just really grateful uh, to be together on Zoom tonight as best we can. And um, thank you for your interest in this topic. So I'm gonna share my screen. And as Andrew has invited me, I'm gonna do just a really basic overview 
of what's in the book. So for those of you who've read the book, sorry about this, <laughs> but maybe just hearing it from a little bit different perspective will be useful. And for those of you who are kind of coming in late and um, joining us, welcome. And we're just gonna introduce these concepts and then we can talk about them a little bit. So I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go. Hang on here. Ah, there we go. All right, how's that look everybody? Great. Good, okay. So I just said the thanks and we're gonna do a little review. So we'll just enjoy this picture of Lake Michigan for one moment. Okay, there we go. So you would not be here if you were not concerned with the reality that we are facing right now, a climate crisis. It is here and it is now. Uh, headlines daily, the headlines in California this week, the flooding, the rains after the droughts and the wildfires, it's real, it's here, it's us. You would not be on this call tonight if you are not well aware of what's going on. But of course, the climate crisis is part of this crisis convergence that we're experiencing right now. We had a pandemic. We are dealing with ongoing racism and racial inequities, economic inequities, political division. There's a Russian invasion of Ukraine. It seems like every day we realize more and more that we are living in this time of upheaval. We are at a kind of inflection point. And if you have been feeling that and not quite had the words for it, um, crisis conversion, infl convergence, inflection point, this is just the phrases that I use to kind of deal with what it feels like to be alive in the early 21st century. So one of the things that's been interesting to me and somewhat dismaying is to observe how the church responds in crisis times. There are, of course, a range of responses, but you might be noticing, as I have, that there are two common ways that the church responds. And I'm speaking of the church very generally here, of course. And the church is not a monolithic thing, but different pockets of the church respond in different ways. So you might have noticed the tendency to kind of bunker up, to hide, to find like-minded people and pretend none of this is happening, <laughs> to find some sort of hiding place and pretend it's not happening. That might be one response, clearly an unhealthy response. But another response is to sort of double down on the church of empire, we might call it, and try to find ways to control and to hook up with power and to avoid changes by taking control. So maybe both of these sort of tendencies for response amid crisis help explain the sort of general carelessness and lack of knowledge about the climate crisis that we are seeing across the church. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a little while. It is true that an inflection point is a time to ask, what if? What if things could be different? And I, I think I began writing this book in the spring of 2020, so right when the pandemic hit. And it was a moment, I think, when a lot of us realized that we were living at this weird crisis inflection point time. And those are very disturbing and very troubling, and it's, it's hard to live in these times. But it's also an opportunity to ask, what if things could be different? And as we're sort of coming out of the pandemic, maybe um, we are starting to ask those questions more. Do we need things to be the same as they were before? They aren't. So what are we going to do? What if, what if things could be different? So I have started to imagine what it might be like to think of ourselves as the people of refugia. If we as Christians, as people who are part of the church, as people of this faith, what if we could think of ourselves as people of refugia? So if you've read the book, you know what that's about, but let's just redefine it for those who are maybe coming in just now. So I came across this term in a wonderful book by Kathleen Dean Moore, the moral philosopher and nature writer. And she uses this image, which I use in the book as well. She uses the image of the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. And she observes that before the eruption, Mount St. Helens was a forested place. And then in 1980, when it erupted, it became this kind of death zone. There was a layer of ash everywhere. And biologists thought, oh man, you know, we're not gonna see green on this mountain. 
for decades, maybe generations. It just, it is so thick with ash. We're just not gonna see anything for a long time. And lo and behold, this is what it looked like right after the eruption. But lo and behold, 25 years later, when this photo was taken, so much of the mountain had greened up again. And so biologists went out there and tried to figure out why. And the answer was that even under that ash, that layer of ash, that death zone, even amid that were these little pockets of life, mosses, little creatures, plants that had been hiding under the shelter of a log or something, some trees that had not in fact been blown over because they were sheltered for some reason. And those places are called refugia. And this is a known concept in biology, but it has taken on a really important new meaning in the world of the climate crisis. So refugial conservation biology is a very active field in biology right now. And that's because refugia are these habitats that components of biodiversity retreat to, persist in, and can expand from in a crisis. They're pockets where life survives in a crisis. This is a known fact about nature. This is how nature renews itself. There are places where capacities rebuild, where soil regenerates, where plant progression begins again. It's how nature renews itself through disturbance. So we can see in this photo here that actually Mount St. Helens greened up pretty well within 35 years. You can still see at the top, it's still ash and rock, but it has greened up remarkably well. That's because of refugia. So when I read that, it just struck me immediately as this kind of powerful metaphor. And immediately I started to think about that as a metaphor for us as Christians. Isn't it true that this is kind of how God has always thought of the people of God? They are the remnant. They are the small, the hidden, the inconsequential. And yet that's how God creates life and renews life. So if you think about scripture, Noah's Ark, the Ark itself is this kind of refugial space through which uh, biodiversity was preserved through the flood, the kind of uncreation and then the recreation. Or if you think about Abraham's family in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, they're just this small inconsequential family, and yet they become the ones through which God blesses all of creation. The Israelites in the desert, I'll mention a little bit more later. Or if you think about the New Testament, Jesus and the disciples, this is not a conquering army or a bunker hiding somewhere. This is a small refugial group through which God changes the world. So seeds and yeast and all these kingdom parables that Jesus tells, it just made me think, I think God really likes refugia. And so I started to sort of explore and pursue this idea and think about refugia as a mechanism of resilience, not only in nature, but in human culture and maybe in the church. Could it be that this moment demands that we become people of refugia in the sense that we become resilient healers? Can we find and nurture refugia in the earth, literally in the earth, can we help nature's process? Um, and can we do that same sort of thing in our human cultural systems, our societies, our churches, our spiritual lives? Can we find those places of life and nurture them along? So that's really the question I asked when I wrote the book. How must our, how must our faith and practice adapt in crisis times and particularly right now? So I started to think in terms of transformations. What are the sort of postures that we have that need to be transformed in order for us to think of ourselves as people of resilience and healing? What do we have to leave behind? What capacities do we have to build? And the more I thought about this, the more uh, and studied, the more I realized we really do have the resources we need in the faith. We have the treasures of our tradition and we have new developments that are happening in eco-theology and, and practice. Uh, we have the resources we need. We just need to use them. So uh, this is how the book is structured. Um, it's structured on seven transformations. And I'm going to give a couple examples of these in just a minute. But here's a slide that shows them, just lists them. 
And if, if you have read the book and you're a very clever reader, you might have found the secret decoder ring to the chapters, which is the liturgical year. I love the liturgical year. It has shaped my faith, my, my congregation, my church that I belong to. We observe and practice the liturgical year with great vigor. <laughs> and so over the past you know, 30 years, as I've been part of this church, it's really shaped how I think about faith. So I wanted to map these transformations onto Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, the seasons of the church year. And it turned out that it actually worked really well. So the other parts of the book that you might have noticed, um, I, I thought it was really important to do some nature writing, partly because I wanted to, <laughs> and partly because, just to be honest, and partly because I thought if I'm going to show in this text the kind of journey that I've been on, part of that journey is learning about where I live and loving and serving that place more attentively and more knowledgeably. So I wanted to model that. I wanted to model what it means to live where you live. Um, so I put these little interstitial chapters of kind of nature writing um, in the book too. And I also want to give a shout out to the wonderful artist, Gabrielle Eisma, who did the artwork for the book while she was still an undergraduate at Calvin University. So I hope you enjoy those beautiful um, drawings that she did for the book. Okay, so a couple examples of these transformations, just to remind you or explain what I'm talking about when I talk about these transformations. The very first one, from despair to preparation. And I thought this one mapped really well to the first season of the church year, which is Advent that comes before Christmas. Advent is a season of expectation, and it's a season in which we allow ourselves to really sink into the distinction between the redemptive vision that we know God has for creation and where we are as we look about the world and we see how very far we are from this redeemed vision of beauty and wholeness and reconciliation. So it's a time when we notice that clash of kingdoms and that can be very distressing. So despair is real, especially at a time of upheaval in, like the one in which we're living. But in the scriptures, those wilderness times are, yes, they're times of loss and grief and often deconstruction of how things are, right? You let a lot go, but they're always times of preparation. So if you think about the Israelites in the desert, as I mentioned before, they are thrilled to be away from slavery for about two minutes, and then they start to complain. I mean, it's literally in the same chapter. It's hard. Change is hard. They've left a lot behind and they don't even know how to be a free people. So it's a time of deconstruction for th or the way they thought the of themselves before, but also preparation. And this, this is why John the Baptist during the texts that lead up to the birth of Christ or the, the ministry of Christ goes back to Isaiah and finds that idea in the wilderness, prepare the way. So if we are feeling like we are in places of wilderness, you know, spiritually, or maybe even literally in some cases, those are opportunities for preparation. How is God preparing us for what's next? That's really the question we have to ask. So that's one example. I'll skip to transformation three. So this is the epiphany chapter. And epiphany is the time of the church year when we think about the life of Christ and for me, the stories uh, that were most pertinent of the life of Christ are the healing stories. Jesus heals some and not others. And that has always bothered me. Like, why don't you heal all the lepers? Why don't you raise all the... But Jesus is showing us the way. We are to become healers in the footsteps of Jesus. And that has come in, the, in our day and age right now to take on very literal meaning. We are not called to be only stewards of creation, this word that you hear all the time in Christian circles. We have to be stewards. That's an important word, but I think it's insufficient. So in the, um, in the book, and maybe later in our conversation, we can talk about the sort of insufficiency of that word to address the fact that we are not living on a whole uh, undamaged earth. We are not in Genesis 2. We are living on a damaged earth. So we have to go actually beyond stewardship and think of ourselves as healers. 
So we have to we have to move from the idea of being consumers, like our lives are just these nomadic lives in which we labor and work in order to consume. That tends to be kind of how we think of our think of our lives in you know post-industrial America at least. Uh, but we have to move from that consuming posture to a posture of healing, not asking what we want, but asking what needs healing and how can we help. And I reference here on this slide, Randy Woodley, um, who I'll mention, you'll actually see a picture of him in a moment, his idea of thinking about the kingdom. And he, he likes to think of the kingdom of God in terms of creation. We don't often think of creation itself when we use that word kingdom. So he urges us to think of the kingdom as very tangible, the created world too. And that is the, the whole scope of redemption includes the created world. So we have to think about that as we move from consuming to healing. Final example here I'll give is chapter from chapter six. Actually, is it six? Yeah. Transformation six in any case. From passivity to citizenship. This is the one I find, um, I, I think, both most exciting and most challenging. It's very tempting for us to honor a sovereign God, to worship God with the honor and reverence that God uh, is worthy of, and then to become passive. Um, we are tempted to just bow down and wait around for God to fix things. God will fix this, God won't let this happen. But that's not actually what we are called to be. We are not merely called to be passive. We are called to agency as the friends of Jesus. That beautiful moment in John 15, during that last supper section um, before the passion, Jesus calls his disciples around him and says, I've called you friends. So that is a, a call to agency and responsibility. We are not just passive worshipers. We are citizens in a resurrection community. And it's very tempting to avoid that because it's costly and frightening and complicated and difficult. And the only way we can do it is through the spirit. So that's why this transformation is Pentecost. It is only through the inspiration of the spirit that we can do this work. So the image you see here is one of these wonderful church uh, forests of Ethiopia. This is a um, phenomenon that has, um, there's been some beautiful essays written about it and some photography that you may have seen, but the idea is that the um, Ethiopian Orthodox Church has for generations preserved forests around their churches. So the churches themselves are round and then it's part of their theology that churches have to be in a forest. It's kind of a callback to Eden. They are preserving a kind of Edenic place. And it, it happens that these preserved churches have managed to save some biodiversity in Ethiopia from the massive deforestation that has taken place in recent decades, mostly due to agriculture and um, cattle raising. So because of theological reasons, these churches has, have actually wound up creating literal fugia where biodiversity has been preserved. And realizing this now, um, environmental uh, scientists and biologists and conservationists are working with these churches to actually make these uh, refugial spaces larger again. So fascinating story. There's more about it in the book. Just a couple examples. I think it's important to see what refugia look like in real life. So a couple examples I know of. The Plaster Creek Stewards, this wonderful group out of Calvin University that is doing literal ecosystem restoration. They are finding small to medium-sized refugia spaces and creating them too uh, in this tributary of the Grand River here in West Michigan, one of the most polluted places in Michigan, one of the most polluted rivers in Michigan was Plaster Creek. And um, it's still not great, but thanks to the Plaster Creek stewards, it's actually getting better. So this is like in the mud, hands-on kind of refugial work. Another example, you've got more people wading in mud here. Um, it's part of climate care, getting involved in the mud. This, this wonderful church, Refuge Church, uh, Refuge Church CRC in Granville, Michigan, they really are refugee, a refugee church in three different ways. Yes, they do outdoor discipleship. They have a creek too. They get their youth group in waders and they do macro invertebrate studies with their youth group. They're trying to repair their little creek behind their church too. But they also are a space for refugees. 
So they are a refugial space for actual refugees and for people with disabilities. So they are very committed to making a safe place for people with disabilities where they can develop their capacities and they can grow as well. So those are maybe not so literal nature refugias, but absolutely valid church refugia. And then here's Randy Woodley. I mentioned him earlier. He has a regenerative agriculture farm in Oregon. He is a Cherokee as well as a Christian pastor. And his, one of his missions is to help train leaders, both um, indigenous people leaders and anybody else who wants to come in regenerative agriculture. So it's kind of a um, calling back the wisdom, the traditional ecological knowledge of American indigenous people, calling back that knowledge and those skills and spreading that. So his farm and um, Center for Earth Justice is a refugial space too. So another example of what that looks like. So just a summary of some refugia characteristics here. I would focus, I think maybe on the contrast between lament and joy. There is grief in these refugial spaces and that's okay. This is a, a place where we can um, realize our grief, share our grief, but they are also places of joy um, for lots of reasons. One is the healing work that goes on in these spaces. Uh, another is the community that happens in these spaces. And so we can maybe talk about that in a little bit. I just want to reassure folks that this, you know, this is not like a, well, I guess we better hunker down and suffer. <laughs> um, if we do, we do that together, but there's also joy. So just to contrast refugia in nature and in culture, refugia um, are meaningful in nature because they protect, transform, connect. That's a lot of how refugia spaces expand and renew an ecosystem, for example, as they start to connect. So they revive in that way. And they're very particular to place and time. In culture, they provide relatively safe spaces, um, whatever in whatever form that might take. And they create freedom to experiment. So this is what I've been observing as I kind of interview people about their literal refugia spaces or their kind of metaphorical refugia spaces. They create a kind of freedom to experiment. And maybe that's something we can talk about with regard to the church today. This is a really important concept, this next one. Refugia leverage small size for big significance. So that is so reassuring. The idea that even a small refugial space actually makes a huge difference. They do connect, they do spread, but even the small makes a difference. And I, I think that's maybe a fundamental Christian principle, right? Nothing is insignificant to God. They build inclusivity through permeable edges. This is how refugia are not the same as bunkers. Their edges are very permeable. That's how they grow. Um, they can, in human refugia can influence through a network of connections. We can give lots of examples of that. And here's that, that point about challenge and joy again. So I just wanna mention a couple of things I've been thinking about since writing the book. So I'll go through this kind of quickly too. Here's the list of things I'm gonna quickly talk about. So let's start with that Pew study. This is very recent, came out November 17. For a long time, especially when I was writing the book, I kind of thought, you know what I really need is a Pew study where they look at what church people or religious people in general all over the US are actually doing about climate change. Gosh, I wish Pew would do that study. Well, they did. <laughs> Apparently they heard me, I don't know, maybe I rubbed a genie lamp or something, but they did the study. Sadly, it's pretty depressing <laughs> because here's what they discovered. If you think about, if you take it as a whole, religion actually seems to get in the way of people taking climate change seriously or engaging in anything more than very small personal actions. Like maybe they recycle, but that's it. This one just kills me. 8% of all Americans are both highly religious and very concerned about climate change. If you're here tonight, you are special because you are part of the 8%. But imagine what it would be like if that were 78% of all Americans or 88% highly religious and concerned about. Imagine what that would be like. You can see the rest of these here and I can send you a link or we can get a link to, to you uh, for this whole study. I wrote about it recently in one of my newsletter issues. It is, it is really disappointing to see this kind of 
um, these kind of statistics. Then I would also say I've been interviewing people on the podcast this past season that all came out this fall was all about Refugia Church. So I interviewed people and asked them, what does Refugia Church look like? So here's some themes that came up this season. Um, we talked a lot about preaching with a couple of my guests. I've had many people say, especially young people, acting on climate change or just action, group action is a spiritual discipline. So maybe we can talk about how important that is to young people. Um, climate action helps repair youth alienation. That theme came up again and again. We could talk about scale a little bit and we can talk about partnership maybe later. I'm also um, working with my husband who's a professor at Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. We have a doctor of ministry cohort called the Refugia Church Cohort. So these are young leaders preparing themselves to lead a refugia church and really asking, what does that even mean? We don't know, we're figuring it out and we're trying to find other people who are thinking about this maybe in different terms. And then here's something I've really been thinking about too. We have to talk about redemption in much more tangible ways, I think. Um, this is what it's going to mean to be the Refugia Church. We have to define redemption as the scriptures do, but we have lost as healing of the earth, as well as racism, poverty. It all goes together. That kingdom redemption vision includes the creation. and We have been neglecting that part. And then community. Who is the we? What is community? Uh, I'm really convinced, too, that it's not going to be okay just to stay in our lane. We have to be partnering with people across the church and outside the Christian faith, with other faiths, with people of no faith. We have to be partnering, partnering with people. So that's really my little presentation tonight, a quick summary of the concepts, um, some things I've been thinking about. And now I would love to hear your questions. Uh, I will stop sharing. Here we go. Thank you so, so much, Deborah. Um, I have like, so many notes and my brain is going everywhere. <laughs> I'm like center myself. Um, and already I see that some people are putting in some questions. Uh, so feel free to, to put your questions in the um, Q&A section. Um, let's see, let's see where I want to start. Cause as you were talking, I had other different questions that come up, but my main question, uh, Deborah, had to do with hope, right? Mm -hmm. In the sort of concluding, uh, sort of pages of your book, I I think you do something that I really appreciate, which I would say like it's a very authentic, honest, and charitable engagement with the idea of hope, right, mm -hmm. in the climate crisis, and not even in the climate crisis, but like a big discussion of hope in the world of justice, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so um, you said you you sort of reference two of my favorite authors. So I'm geeking <laughs> around Tanati Coates and uh, mm -hmm. Austin Channon Brown, and you sort of talk about their perspective and how they approach that. Um, and then you sort of move into talking about what Christian hope, active mm -hmm. hope, right? Mm -hmm. um, looks like and with Romans 5, all that. Um, if you haven't read that, <laughs> please read that in the book. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting exploration there. But my, my, my sense is that, um, we are not feeling the hope, right? We are not holding mm -hmm. on to that. I realized this week and, and that at work, we were having a conversation and I, I said, hope has felt particularly dangerous to me in the last couple of years. Now it's situated in a, a larger context of not only our work, right? But like in everything happening in the world. Um, and so it's so difficult to latch onto that. And it's so difficult to latch onto that, especially talking from a generational perspective, right? People in the younger generation um, are sort of stuck in the despair. So my question to you is that since reflecting, um, since writing the book and still going on some observations and reflections, mm -hmm. one, do you still reflect those positions in, in that <laughs> of hope? Mm -hmm. um, and if you do, how do you nurture that um, in an authentic way, right? How to sort of not be in the cheap, easy hope kind of right. ideal that we find particularly rampant in Christian circles, so. Yeah, wow, thank you for that. Um, my I taught an environmental literature class last semester and my students enjoyed 
the two words doomism and hopium. <laughs> Those are the two extremes we want to try to avoid, right? Doomism is it's hopeless. It's only going to get worse. People are terrible. Uh, Calvinists are tempted by that one because of total depravity. Yeah, people are terrible. Um, the world is getting worse. We're all going to be dead by 2100 or something. That's doomism. And I, I think as Christians, we, we just have to reject that. And as students of history, we have to reject that too, because it's true. The climate crisis is different from anything else in history, but there have been some really grim times in history before. And, you know, we are, to be surprised by difficulty is a sign that we have been sheltered and privileged. Mm. And I realize that myself. And, mm. and I'm just aware of how much of a baby I am about that. And so I have to learn from people who have not had that. And that's why, you know, these incredible African-American writers and thinkers are so helpful in thinking about reality and hope. You know, hope is not the idea that, oh, things are going to be fine. You know, everything's going to be fixed and it'll be fine. We'll just kind of get through this crisis. That's just not real. And, and we have to learn from people who have figured that out and made it past the doomism. On the other hand, you don't want to be just Pollyanna-ish and, you know, have hopium and hide from the reality of it either. And I think as Christians, we're also called to be involved and to be, as I, as I was saying, you know, citizens in a resurrection community. Fortunately, the faith and the scriptures are full of people dealing with difficulty. It's not like we don't have teachers. <laughs> so to, to just, um, I, I think, find that space. And this is why I think the refugee idea is a little bit helpful because everything doesn't have to be perfect if you can find some spaces of life, whatever that means, right? Um, health and life that you can really lean into and, and say, this is what I'm gonna to commit to and try to make grow and to connect with other people who are doing that. So for me, that the continued sort of nurturing of hope is really a matter of action and community, being connected with people who are doing the work. Uh, we do not have a guarantee everything's going to be great. Uh, we probably have a guarantee that life is hard because it always is. But what we do have is other people in it with us and the work of the spirit. And never underestimate the work of the spirit. Nothing is impossible for God, right? Mm -hmm. So I do lean heavily on the faith. But I also think by, by doing that, you also have to be doing something. Mm -hmm. So that you feel like you have agency and you can see small differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taking some notes because I need that personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, Steve, do you do you want to come in with your question before we we take some of the questions from our audience? Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and thank you, Deborah, for tonight. But thank you for the book. I mean, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. It's just beautifully written. I've talked to lots of people about it and suggested that they read it. And one thing I've, I've made a comparison with your book and with uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's um, Braiding Sweetgrass, wow. just because of the beauty of the writing. It is oh, such beautiful writing. Thank you. So thank you for that. Um, so this is a um, th this is a, a the webinar tonight is sponsored by the Climate Witness Project, and the project has um, is really about congregations taking action on climate in four areas: worship, education, energy stewardship, and advocacy. And I, I think. Um, we do pretty well with the last three. The first one, worship, is the one that I'm always thinking, hey, gosh, there's really, you know, we do have a collection of, of, um, of songs and uh, liturgies, some that you wrote, actually, um, litanies, prayers. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff, I think, is used in, the, in, the, in Reformed uh, churches. Mm -hmm. But I have yet to hear a sermon that addresses climate change specifically. A, a full sermon. And, and, and as I thought about that, I think I can't remember ever hearing, hearing, even hearing the term climate change in a Reformed church sermon. Mm. So um, I just wondered about that. I wonder what you thought about that. Why is that? And is there something we can do about that? <laughs> okay, really great question. Um, I would, I have a lot to say about it, but, but I would also recommend that folks listen to the episode of my podcast where I interview Leah Shade. Leah Shade is a Lutheran homiletician, and this is exactly the question. 
she has mm. asked. And she's done quite a bit of research about it. It's not just in Reformed churches that this is happening. There are other, it, you know, it's kind of across the board in American uh, Christianity. I think Catholicism would be included. And she has studied why, and she has studied what to do about it and written two oh, wonderful books about what to do about it. So for pastors out there or, um, you know, for church council people who are out there and want to say, yeah, we, we really need to do this. Leah Shade is the person to go to. She's got one book called Preaching in the Purple Zone. Yeah. Uh-huh. And one book called um, Creation Crisis Preaching. And then she has a website called Eco Preacher something, something, Eco Preacher 123 or something like that. It's all in my show notes on the podcast. So she's really trying to answer that question. And, and from the Lutheran tradition, which is our, you know, sort of sibling tradition. I mean, we can all guess why, right? Number one, it's so politicized. Right. Climate, climate talk is so politicized in the U.S. Um, and pastors just don't want to go there. And I think pastors don't feel equipped. Like this is not their training. They don't, they, and they know that the minute they say certain words, people are going to freak mm -hmm. out. Lee has actually done research on those words. Um, so we know why. And it's, and the other, maybe the other reason is that in reformed circles, uh, at least, you know, I don't know exactly how necessarily all reformed pastors are trained now, but you are not allowed really to do topical sermons. You would do scriptural sermons. Yeah. <laughs> so to, to, preach about climate change actually raises some hackles for me too because i'm like no you preach the scripture right but the scripture is full of things that are relevant and that's maybe um where to begin uh, to to find those passages and they're not hard to find all the greatest hits are in my book i mean they're not that hard to find but to to sort of claim this broad reformed vision Colossians 1, you know, Christ reconciles all things to himself, all creation, the groaning of all creation. I mean, it's all there. We just haven't been paying attention. So pastors are just not necessarily trained in eco-theology or in interpreting those scripture passages in that way. So I would say Leah Shade is the answer to that question for people who are trying to like, yeah, we really should be talking about this more. Um, and then another possible um, answer would be Jim Antal, who I also interviewed on the oh, podcast. Yeah. He has a book called Climate Church, Climate World, which has a little, a pretty good chapter on preaching in it. It's among a lot of other things, but that chapter on preaching is pretty good too. Yeah. yeah thank you for that question. Yeah. And you know what I thought about the t that today was because of uh, our, our friend Kyle Mayard Shops uh, um, talk today at um, the January series. I know you were there because you introduced him. <laughs> but, but Kyle was one of the persons that started the Climate Witness Project um, in the CRC. And as I was listening to his talk today, I was, I was thinking, gosh, a lot of this could be, a, I mean, this could be a sermon with some tweaks and some changes oh, yeah. here and there, but this could be a sermon. I could, I could, oh, yeah. I would love to hear this sermon at church. <laughs> so, way ahead way, of and, you. And, and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> way ahead of you in thinking of how we do. I mean, I know if Calvin would allow us to have the recording, but yes, yeah. let's, let's, yeah, there are some ideas well, around that. In his book, he has like a, I don't know, very short chapter where he does that run through, that scriptural run through. He yeah. like hits the greatest hits. So that would be a, a wonderful little cheat book <laughs> for preachers who are thinking, I would like to do this. And, yeah. you know, as you asked about worship too, Steve. And I would say one really kind of low impact, low threshold way to start working on this is to, um, first of all, get involved with the Climate Witness Project, of course. You guys have so many great resources. But in worship in particular, you kind of have an excuse to do something with worship and preaching during the creation season, which is this new kind of six-week season. Um, you know, you can find out more about it. There's a website, there's resources, and it's ecumenical, which is awesome. So you feel like you're joining this whole global Christian church doing this creation season. And that's maybe a really good time to start doing things in worship. Mm -hmm. There are resources. Uh, I've got, you know, on my sort of book pile, like a big old Lutheran resource and a Catholic resource that I haven't really worked through yet. Um, there are more and more songs. So that climate vigil album um, yep. with Porter's Gate is mm -hmm. just great. We've yeah. made great use of those songs. 
there's a group called Doxicology out of Britain that has some kind of fun songs too. So it's coming along. The worship resources are coming along, but there's just a lot of opportunity there yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're not mentioning the uh, liturgies that you and Ron wrote for the season of creation. <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, we <laughs> did celebrate great. the season of creation um, <laughs> last year, which was great. And this is something that we are hoping to sort of bake in into our liturgical uh, calendar for at least in the CRC reform context. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yes, really, really helpful. Well, um, to be fair, Ron and I pretty much patched those together. So it's not like we came <laughs> up with all of it, right? Just out of whole, we, we patched together a bunch of stuff. Some of it was from a Len Vanderzee written yes. liturgy right. from the past. And yep. you know how it is at Church of the Servant CRC. <laughs> Rapids, we like steal, steal, steal from everything. <laughs> but I, we've done that liturgy twice now. And I, I, it feels really good to me yeah. to go through it. And people are welcome to use it. There's no copyright on it or anything so i don't know is is it on the website somewhere andrew yes yep yes, it is. i think yep we have that so you might even like definitely. see our bulletin in a pdf form or something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely add it to we'll try and curate a kind of resource list for a follow-up sure. email to folks on there and just highlight some of these things um i'm turning my attention to to the q uh, q a and thank you all we asked for questions and questions are coming in so that's great um I'm going to pick this one, which uh, is from Tim. Tim says, how do we expand from the 8%? How do we <laughs> motivate um, an activist Christianity, so to speak? And I think this is something that's really important, right? We talk about like acti uh, activism as a refugial practice. You, you kind of mm -hmm. shed some light um, of that in the book. But how do we do that? Um, and this is to all of us, the three of us, with mm -hmm. some insights and perspective to, to that question. Well, Andrew, you start. This is what you're doing. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh, I have some ideas. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, I have some ideas, but it's 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 pretty tedious. But I think we've made progress, right? Like you, um, Steve, you were referencing Kyle. I'm sure like years ago at the beginning of this project and the work, um, he wouldn't have imagined how we've moved the needle and how we've sort of galvanized the whole sort of movement in this. Um, but I think just to, to reference good old Catherine Hayhoe, right? She mm -hmm. says the, yes. the, the most effective thing you can do is to talk about it, right? We need to keep talking about it. Because I think sometimes we, we can be in a very like insular ecosystem in the climate movement where we hear it over and over again. We see the, uh, the headlines, we get the news digest. So we think it's like everyone's cup of tea. It should be, right? But like it would surprise you the spaces that you go in that this is not coming on the radar. And so we, you talked about, right, community. How do we, how do we dig where we stand? And when you were talking about earlier about the nature writing, my mind again went to sort of the indigenous practice of like theology of place, right? You need to dig where you stand and digging where you stand means every sphere of influence that you have. And so you need to talk about it with people. Um, we all have all these different social networks and groups that we are part of. Talk about it. Like, I think it, it seems very trite and almost like an empty platitude. And when I first like heard Catherine say it, I, it took me a while to see what she was saying, where it's, yeah. we need to keep talking about it because we can't be, we need, if we, we are going to open the tent and invite more people in, we can exclude, right? One of the characteristics of creating refugia is inclusivity, right? And so we need to talk about it. We need to find common ground. Um, and we also need to just combat the lies. I'm in the, <laughs> I'm in the business of like myth busting. Like, oh. I think we need to meet, we need to meet the same urgency of the moment with the misinformation and the lies mm -hmm. that just keep coming. You need to, to meet that. It doesn't mean you are um, sort of fighting or attacking people. It just means you are coming at them with what we know is verifiable information and reliable information. Um, so I think those are the two things. I mean, there's a whole laundry list of things that we can talk about, but I think just educating yourself, talking about it, engaging in good faith conversation um, is a starting point because 
it's almost ironic that the whole environmental justice movement was started by people of faith, right? Like Warren County, North Carolina, pastors and people of faith resisting in the, in, in the Black community, environmental pollution, and sort of catalyzed the movement. And it seems we've lost our way in that conversation. Um, but I could go on and on. I will stop myself. <laughs> um, but I think I think that's something that's important for us to, to be able to, to name. Uh, let's myth bust and let's also talk about it. And we need to stop being exclusionary. I think I find a lot of people in this conversation who are always finger pointing. Uh, sometimes it's needed to an extent to like combat the misinformation. But I think we need to be embracing of more perspectives, even outside our faith traditions, right? You talk a little bit about that as well, Deborah. but mm -hmm. just, my, just my two cents. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, my solution to everything is read a bunch of books, which is just <laughs> maybe not the right solution for everybody. <laughs> read a bunch of books or go talk to people. I mean, that's not my solution either. Although Catherine Hayhoe's book, Saving Us. So Steve, you were asking about like, what have I read since my book came out? Well, Catherine Hayhoe's Saving Us, um, it makes that point, but also sort of tells you how to do it. Exactly. Yep. And I find that terrifying, like talking to people. I mean, I don't mind this, right? Because we're like, we're preaching to the choir here, but talking to people about something that I'm, I'm afraid they're going to be like, nah, -uh, because I heard on whatever that uh, that's not my cup of tea, but she explains how to do it. And actually Kyle's book is pretty good on that too. Kyle's book has got an advocacy, but if like reading and talking is not your thing, um, action, you know, I, I think, as you mentioned, environmental injustice, getting yourself and maybe some people from your church or something involved in some task of environmental injustice that's going on, then you're actually dealing with people and, and people's needs. And that feels like a more familiar place um, for a lot of people than, you know, just talking about climate change. So that might be a thing or, you know, as I was saying before, literally the mud, I, I think the kind of ecosystem regeneration work, you don't have to say a word. You just get down on your knees and you plant native plants. And that's the sort of thing that uh, all ages can get involved in. And it's not full of conflict and words, words, words. It's, it's hands-on, it's tangible. <laughs> so that might be a way to, to just start moving people you know the question was what do we why can't why is it eight percent and how can we move that um lots and lots of ways and you just kind of have to find your way into being involved and the more of us that do that the more that needle is going to move yeah and just playing off of that I, I would definitely encourage anybody on this call who's not already a climate awareness partner to become a partner because that doesn't commit you to anything <laughs> except re except receiving our emails which you can do with whatever you want with those but some of them are going to might and our great resources your interest <laughs> and our resources right so you can use these things you can read you can say oh that maybe i can get involved with that maybe that maybe that is something that's of interest to me um i was one another thing kyle said this afternoon was um you know, he hates that question, you know, what's, what's the one thing everybody should do? Well, there isn't anything that everybody should do, but everybody can do something. Mm -hmm. And I, so I, I try to stay away from should also, but um, encourage people to follow their heart, just as you were saying, Deborah, if you want to get your hands dirty, get your hands dirty and, and work on some gen regenerative agriculture in your backyard. Mm -hmm. But but at least become a partner and then you can see what we're doing. And then maybe you would be inspired to actually create a team at your at your congregation, mm -hmm. which is really what we're hoping people do. And if you if you want to talk about that, I'm, I would love to talk to you about it because I've had a fair amount of experience with that now. And I think I know some things that work and I know some things that don't work so well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think I think just connecting back to like, Bill Moyer talks about like the four <laughs> roles of active activism or taking like compelling action. And he talks about like there, we all have different roles to play, right? There are some people who are activists in there. There are some people who dialogue with stakeholders. Like we each have a role to play. And I think sometimes in this conversation, there's a tendency to uplift one particular role as the role, right? Um, right. That sort of gets us there, but we each have a role to play in the great tapestry of God's faithfulness. And it's about digging where you stand. Again, I think that idea is, is really important to, to cultivate. Um, I wanted to 
pick another uh, question here. Um, it says, uh, climate change is unlike many other kinds of natural disasters in that it isn't a wave that comes and goes. The warmer the world is, it's not going away. Thus, refugia communities need to be places of adaptation. So the question there is, how do we encourage people of faith to lean into the opportunities for adaptation, especially when people point to biblical admonishments against conforming to the world? Whoa. Oh, interesting. Oh, I got to think about that one. Um, so the adaptation would be seen as conforming to the world. I'm trying to think what an example of that might be. Huh. Maybe the questioner would want to clarify that a little bit, because I, I think I'm wondering how an adaptation, how working on adaptations would be seen as conforming to the world. Would it have to do with maybe partnering with people who aren't necessarily Christian? Is that kind of what they're mm -hmm. thinking or just changing the way we do things? Is that mm -hmm. maybe um yeah. Yes, I think I think the person who asked that is mm -hmm. is is saying that. Yeah. Yeah. So like Possibly. any change mm -hmm. is seen as conforming to the world. Yep. Um mm. gosh, so many ways to approach that, I guess. Mm. Um in the Reform Journal recently, which is the, the publication, online publication that I watch for every two weeks, we had this essay by a guy named Sid Heilinga, where he did a sort of spec fiction version of the church in 2047. And we've all been kind of responding to it, you know, as part of our little plan here as writers. And uh, one of the things he suggested, I'm trying to think what I was gonna say about this. Um, one of the things he noted was that he kind of painted a picture of a refugia church, actually. It was like a house church kind of thing he was dealing with. And one of the things to notice about it is it's extremely local. So to answer that, how do we get people to do adaptations? I don't know. It's going to be different if you're in California and you're adapting to wildfires and smoke all the time. Or if you're in Florida and you're dealing with ocean rise, it's going to be different. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say about him, but one of the things Sid did in that essay was to talk about the builder generation, the protector generation, and then he posits a kind of inclusive generation. So what he was doing was, was looking at folks who are afraid of change right now, and why not? Because there's a lot of it. I'm afraid of change too. He was calling them the protectors in order to sort of honor the idea that they are valuing what was built in previous generations. So often people who are in that kind of protector mode, like we can't change anything, um, they're, they're not wanting to deal with the grief of losing something that was valuable. So that's, that's worth sort of acknowledging, right? That this is, it's kind of an unacknowledged grief often. Um, and then just to have the perspective of history and realize that things are always changing. I mean, the church is not anything like it was 200 years ago, 500 years ago, a thousand years ago. Things are always changing. There's no way we can protect the way things are. There's just no way. So to pretend that what we have now is the pristine thing and any change we are deviating from the pristine thing, that's just not true. So I think you just have to face that. And then as far as adaptation goes, um, we have a lot of Christian freedom. So you, we have to discern, we have to discern what, what we value and what is the essence of the tradition. And then, I don't know, how do we avoid changing? I don't think we can. Well, that was a very lame answer. <laughs> I need some help. And I don't know if I'm addressing what the, what the questioner was thinking of, but maybe it was just that fear of change. Yeah. What, what are some thoughts you have, Steve and Andrew? Yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to see. I think there was a follow-up to that that brought some oh, good. clarity that I'm trying. And it's like, might there be some kind of uh, spiritual adaptation that is needed as we live into this new reality? And I think, mm -hmm. I think it's, it connects to what mm -hmm. you were describing, Deborah. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
you know, a lot of people are talking about deconstruction right now. And there's a sort of, it's a sort of controversy, like deconstruction, what's that all about? And other, everybody else is like, oh, deconstruction. Yes, we're all involved. I just think that's healthy faith, honestly, that we are always, you know, semper reformata, sub verbum dei, right? We are always reforming under the word of God. Um, so that spiritual adaptation, I, I guess I'm just really convinced that we have a lot of the resources we need in the Christian tradition for the spiritual needs that we have right now. Um, the need to be able to live faithfully in the wilderness, mm -hmm. um, the need to attend to those who are not like us, um, you know, the kind of good Samaritan sort of situation, um, mm -hmm. the need to be citizens. That is part of that. I mean, I'm just really convinced that the spiritual resources we need are in the tradition. They are often hidden. We have to uncover them again. Hmm. but they're there they're there hmm. in the scripture they're there in the theological tradition it's not like we don't need anything new mm -hmm. but for people who are worried about change i think it's really helpful to say but this is part of the faith it has hmm. been part of the faith mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so i don't know if that was helpful but yeah. that's kind of how i look at this yes we are in a time of deconstruction but we are looking to the treasures old and new yeah. and a lot of them are old we just have to mm -hmm. find them again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think you know, it just connects and dovetails well with like Kyle's <laughs> message which was like climate action is Christian discipleship right this is something that is within the tradition um so mm -hmm. to speak but sorry Steve you you had yeah no I was just gonna say um when Deborah was talking about how adaptation is a local phenomenon um you know it made me think about this something that I learned just recently so you know we're working on this project called the solar faithful and I can talk more about that, but if you're a, if you're a climate witness partner, you'll hear be seeing stuff about this in the next couple of weeks. We're going to do a, another webinar at the beginning of February, all about solar faithful. But one of the things is we've we're, we've talked to about 200 congregations about putting solar on their mm -hmm. roof at no cost to them, and um, we're starting to get a few questions from, especially from environmental justice communities, about um, battery storage. And I thought, well, why is battery storage an important thing? It's not something that I would have thought about as being particularly part of adaptation. But the reason is, you know, these are communities that frequently lose power and don't get it back right away. And so they need battery power so that they can be cooling centers, but also just to let people charge their phones. Yeah. And I thought, wow, I am just, I really am a person of privilege. It never occurred to me that that would be a problem. So that taught me a couple of things. One is, you know, we've got to be listening to these uh, frontline environmental justice communities and make sure we understand what their needs really are and what their what the impacts of climate change really are on them and how we can help them um, work through that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Francis talks about the church as the field hospital. Like we are not the lovely social club that does our own thing and then preaches, just goes out, preaches the gospel and it's all about ascent and intellectual. You know, he, he says, look, the church is a field hospital. We need to be out there as medics for people yeah, yeah. who are in need. And this is going to be more and more tangible needs. Um, I interviewed for the podcast Rabbi Dean Shapiro. His name is, he pronounces it Shapiro. And he has fabulously practical ideas for synagogues that we can learn from too. And one of the things he actually, one adaptation that he's been experimenting with is taking the traditional Jewish rituals and thinking about what they might mean differently in a time of climate change. And I thought that was a really interesting challenge too. And maybe we need to think up new rituals, um, not that we would replace the sacraments by any means, we need the sacraments for sure, but we have our little rituals. Maybe we need kind of new and different ones. And isn't it a interesting creative challenge to think can we bless can we have rituals for blessing a farm field or a garden mm -hmm. can we have rituals for grieving after a disaster wouldn't that be a, a spiritual thing that we can do to heal not only people in our church but community <laughs> people? couldn't that be a, that would be an example of being the church mm -hmm. of Fugia. Mm -hmm. sorry Andrew, go ahead i love no i I, I love that. Um, just looking at our, our, our time here, um, there are so many good, great questions that have been 
coming up. Um, like we said, we'll definitely follow up with some some of these resources that we've uh, discussed. Um, but when when you both were talking, and Steve, when you were talking about sort of dealing with this conversation with impacted people, right? It just again brought my mind back to. Um, a sentiment or a principle in disability justice and indigenous justice about nothing about us without us, right? Those who are most impacted mm. need to be there. Nothing about us without us. And so if we're able to sort of reorient our minds is that the most impacted people, people on the front lines, need to not only be at the table as almost like a, sort of a performative checkbox, but we need to have a very authentic engagement with those who are most impacted. And that's something that I think for us as a project, for people in this movement, um, we need to think about critically, right? How do we make sure like stakeholders um, are part of this um, in very meaningful ways and not in like a performative way, which sometimes our culture um, sort of gravitates to. So just, just another thing that um, came to mind. Um, so I, yeah, I wanted to open it up uh, for some last insights and thoughts. I mean, we could go <laughs> on and on. <laughs> we all could jump on our soapbox on this. And this has been a really great conversation. Um, if you really want to dive deeper, uh, again, we encourage you to get uh, the book. We encourage you to visit the Refugia podcast. Uh, there's been a there's a lot of resources and information about this uh, that we will include in our follow up. But to to sort of close our time together, I I wanted to open it up and I I will start with you, Steve, and then um, come to Deborah about what what is. What is, and it, it's not to be, again, trite, but what is keeping you going <laughs> in this, in this sort of space? Uh, Steve, I know you've been, you've been doing this for a long time and, and sometimes it can be very <laughs> painful. <laughs> um, it's so hard to sometimes see the progress, but I think for me, it's just been, like you were saying, Deborah, who people have gone through this in different <laughs> contexts. Think about racial justice in this country, other things like, and those people, those pillars, we look to for some cues and directions. And those stories personally helped me to hold on, right? To, to sort of go through the motion. So I'm just curious from a personal perspective, what is motivating you or driving you uh, to still keep the faith, so to speak? Yeah. Well, I, I just don't feel like I have any other choice. And I don't, I don't think about hope as a, as a feeling at all. I, I always think about it as an obligation or a, um, a decision. So I have to be hopeful and I'm going to be hopeful because it, it's going it, to, it could always be worse. So we can make, whatever we do is going to be helpful. Um, one of the things that struck me that both Deborah and Kyle uh, said recently, uh, or in the books and, and also in, in speaking, is to think about some of these things as spiritual disciplines. That was really helpful to me because I never really thought about it that way. So sometimes, you know, some of these individual actions that you can take, um, I don't know, just to, trying to think of a good example, but, you know, like recycling or whatever. Um, I, I go crazy on that stuff. And it's not because it's, it doesn't make me feel righteous and it doesn't make me feel like I'm putting on my hair shirt and I'm really suffering doing this stuff. It's because it gets to be quite fun. You know, the more you, you think about it, it's like, oh, man, I wonder if I could do without that. You know, I probably could. And sure enough, I can. <laughs> and, and maybe I could do this differently. And yeah, I can do that too. So yeah. it's 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 very uh, it's very exciting and fun to do. And and when you can find a group of people to share that stuff with, it's just really cool. Mm -hmm. And then just the, the, one other thing that, that and Kyle mentioned this this afternoon too. Just in the, the last six months or so, the policy changes have yeah. been enormous. Yeah. And that makes me feel extremely hopeful. <laughs> I mean, so so many things can happen now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just really excited about what the, what, what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I love the whole spiritual discipline conception. Um, I think that's something that we really talk about in our work in circles, especially with advocacy, right? How do we conceive of advocacy and action as a spiritual discipline. I'm always grateful to my friend and past colleague, Kate Coyman, who really modeled this and, and helped me to see it. Because I asked her, like, why do you keep calling this representative's office, right? As we and engage in and bring in delegations and 
there's nothing that happens. And she really explained it about this is a spiritual discipline, just like we approach prayer. The fact that you keep coming to it builds within you a kind of capacity. Yes, um, yes. And I, yeah, just a marvelous way she described it that has stuck with me for, for many years now. So I think, yes, it's a reorientation of, of our mind uh, when it comes to this. Um, how about you, Deborah? Oh, well, I was just thinking, I, I'm just, I'm built to be happy when I have a task. So the fact that there's tons of work to do is actually like, yes. What's your um, Enneagram? I'm so, I'm so curious about three, your Enneagram. That is my okay, idea. perfect. Yep. Um, I would say maybe two other things. Um, <laughs> just reconnecting with nature. Um, there's birds out there. It's amazing. I mean, I've spent my life with my nose in a book, right? So being able to uh, attend knowledgeably, more and more knowledgeably to the place where I live is in itself a joy. Mm -hmm. um, partly because, you know, there's like no people there. But then my second reason is meeting people and connecting with people I didn't know, uh, people across the church, uh, across faiths, and realizing that there's there are just people all over the world, amazing people all over the world. Um, some of them like sophisticated, powerful leaders. Some of them, you know, just incredibly resourceful people without a lot of uh, power or influence or anything who are just doing amazing and creative things. So to be on, um, you know, calls like this, to be on newsletters and, uh, <clears throat> to watch documentaries or whatever, just to see the people who are doing this work of renewing the creation, whether they're doing it from that Christian point of view or not. Um, I just think that's the work of the spirit. So I see God at work through these amazing people and then to actually get to meet them or talk with them or be connected with them in some way, um, that just keeps me going. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, Thank you so, so much, uh, Deborah. We're so blessed uh, by, I have so many notes <laughs> here that I would be sort of following up on and including in, in the work that we're doing. Um, and just to also give a special shout out to our guests and participants for tonight. Thank you so, so much uh, for joining us. There are a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of expression of thanks in the questions about your book, Deborah, and how Thank that you. has been a source of joy and anchor for a lot of people in these very challenging times. So thank you um, so much for that. Uh, like we said, we would definitely follow up with uh, some of the resources that we shared. There were some resources also shared in the uh, Q&A function, but thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we will keep on <laughs> carrying on in this work because it's important, it is necessary, um, and it's part of the gospel and it's part of our faith. Um, so stay tuned for more updates. Uh, uh, we have, like Steve said, very exciting things coming down the pipeline uh, with the Climate Witness Project. So please sign up uh, if you are not already a member and we will stay tuned with all these resources. So thank you so much. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you.